So I thought I would start first by uh, some background from physics, since many uh, of the math grad students uh, might not be familiar with the physics motivation for this. So in physics, we have, well, we have first of all classical field theory. Um, so, yes, uh, in physics you usually start by stu studying motion of particles, but then, for example, um, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism is not in terms of particles, but in, ter in terms of uh, fields. So something that um, takes, um, yeah, that takes a value at every point in your space. So basically what happens is you have a manifold. The general setup is you have a manifold, and you have some fields on M. And this, well, mathematically, these are just sections of a sheaf. Uh, but what can they be? So but typically, they're vector fields or connections or maybe maps from M to, uh, to a fixed manifold, but there's some, some assignments that, um, yes, assign something at every point on the manifold. And then, depending on your physical system, you study the time evolution of the fields. Uh, so roughly, you're, you're working on a space-time, which is um, M times, um, well, it's basically M times uh, zero, one. Um, and another thing that usually happens is that the evolution depends on a metric. So M comes with, uh, with a Riemannian metric. It I mean, physics usually depends on distances. Great. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about this. Uh, now, later physicists developed quantum field theory. Okay, so what is quantum field theory? I won't be able to tell you now, but uh, it's a field theory that also incorporates quantum effects um, meaning that the energy is quantized, it's n times it's some integer times a quantity, the Planck constant, and then when you set uh, when you let h bar go to zero, you get the classical limit. Uh, and then it also should incorporate special relativity. Meaning Lorentz invariance. Uh, okay, so physicists developed theories that involve this, um, all these things, and we will actually have um, an introductory lecture on quantum field theory. We added it to the schedule on Friday by Max Zimmert. Uh, and yes, he will tell you more about this if you're not familiar with it. Uh, let me just say that this was a very powerful um, idea in physics, so it explained kind of three of the fundamental forces of nature. Um, it explains, well, electromagnetism. Uh, it explained the weak forces and the strong forces in particle physics. Um, great. So th th this formed a standard model. of particle physics. Um, the one force that is not, that doesn't quite fit into the picture is gravity. And while physicists have, um, have tried to incorporate gravity into a QFT and then they, they develop various other theories like string theory. Um, and in the process they, studied, they, they started studying QFTs on their own. So some, there are some interesting QFTs that you can kind of write as toy models for nature and you can see what um, yes, what could be, uh, like just theoretically, what QFTs uh, are interesting. And in the process, that's how um, they discovered that some QFTs are just topological. And this led to the, I mean, it, they do not depend on the metric. So this led to the concept of topological quantum field theory. Uh, 
Uh, so TQFT. And some people call this just topological field theory. In fact, in, so this is a mathematical concept. It was introduced by, uh, by Atia in 1988. Uh, and I think Jake Rasmussen talked about TQFTs last week, and you're gonna see them again in, in the other lecture series as well. Um, there's nothing quantum in the definition. Uh, I think they were called TQFTs because they came from quantum field theories, but the definition doesn't refer to quantum, so some people just call them topological field theories. All right, so let me remind you um, the definition. So, right, so instead of working on a cylinder, now you work on any cobordism, like manifold with boundary, maybe from Y0 to Y1, so this is a, um, manifold W, so the dimension of W is D plus one, and the dimension of Y I is D. Uh, and then you wanna have some spaces associated to the D-dimensional manifolds, and some maps associated to the cobordisms. Okay, so um, yes, and they should satisfy some properties, they should compose well, um, typically, uh, these things are, um, are vector spaces or modules. More generally, you can talk about, um, let's see, a C-valued D plus one dimensional TQFT, where C is a symmetric monoidal category. So a symmetric monoidal category is, well, it's a category where, which, where you have a monoid. Okay, so I'm not gonna give the precise definitions, but you have basically a tensor product of objects and of morphisms and satisfy some properties. And also it's symmetric in the sense that you have isomorphisms between A tensor B and B tensor A. Okay, so the examples to keep in mind are just vector spaces over a field K or modules over a ring R. Um, and yes, another important category, symmetric monoidal category is cobordisms in dimension D plus one where the objects are closed, maybe, yes, closed oriented, let's say D manifolds and the tensor product is the disjoint union, and uh, yes, and the morphisms are cobordisms. So in this language, a TQFT is a symmetric monoidal functor from C to, oh uh, sorry, from from cobordisms to C. So it's exactly something like this, and um, but it should it should preserve the uh, monoidal structure. So um, if you have um, disjoint union, then you should get the tensor product of the Z's and so on, and some properties with re with regard to the morphisms as well. Okay, so I think Soren will talk more about uh, the exact definition. Uh, let me say uh, one thing. So in a TQFT you can also consider D plus one dimensional manifolds, closed, and then you can think of them as cobordisms from the empty set to the empty set. So let's say that our category is vector spaces over a field. Then this gives you a map from 
k to k, z of x, uh, and that's just an element in k. So basically to close d plus one dimensional manifolds, you associate, uh, you associate elements in your base field or base ring. And yes, what else? So there, are, I mean, this is the cleanest definitions, but in practice you have some variations of the notion of TQFT. So you have to be flexible with, re with respect to the definition. So for example, you can talk about manifolds equipped with various things like base points, and paths, so this is kind of what happens in Hegart floor homology. Um, you have to, yes, you have to give a base point here and then maybe a path, and that's, that's when you can associate a math, a map. Um, you, you can also sometimes, they should be equipped with spin C structures, so um, yeah, so it's not exactly from the cobordism category, but from a variation of that, like manifolds equipped with something. Or a very interesting case is equipped with, equipped with embedding. Embeddings may be in some fixed other manifold, let's say RD. Um, so this is the, the most important case is that of knots inside R3. So knots are just one-dimensional manifolds, but they come with embeddings, and then you can talk about TQFTs for knots, where you not only have uh, the cobordism, but everything is embedded in R3 and then times zero one, and you associate maps, uh, you associate, let's say, vector spaces to the knots, and then maps to cobordisms between the, between the knots that are embedded in the cylinder. All right. Okay, so now let me, uh, let me give some simple examples of TQFTs. Okay, let me start with the simplest case, which is one plus one dimensional TQFTs. Uh, yes, and this, these are the same as what's called Frobenius algebras. They're basically determined by that, by an algebraic structure. Uh, so why is that? Well, there's only one um, connected closed one manifold, namely the circle. So Z of S1 is some, let's say some vector space A. Um, and then you have maps, so you have a multiplication corresponding to this cobordism. So this is mu from A tensor A to A. So that's why this is an algebra. Uh, but you have some extra structures, so, oh yes, you also have a unit corresponding to this, so this is a map from K to A, which is, gives you a unit element in the algebra, maybe we can call it eta. You also have a co-unit, so a map epsilon from A to K. And then you have a co-multiplication given by uh, this, um, Yes, given by this kind of cobordism. So going from here to here. So like A goes to A tensor A. Let's call it delta. And okay, and they have to satisfy some properties. And I'm not gonna say what these are, but basically well, every cobordism between uh, one manifolds can be decomposed into pairs of pants and then these caps and cups. Okay, and this have to satisfy some properties, so if you write down what it is, this gives you the concept of a Frobenius algebra. All right, so actually what's an example of a Frobenius algebra? Um, here's a Frobenius algebra. 
h star of s2, which is f of, um, well, let's say, k of x, so over a field um, x over x squared, x squared equals zero, x is the generator in degree two, and then I can write down what these maps are, so the multiplication is just the polynomial multiplication, epsilon of one equals zero, the unit is the unit, epsilon of x equals one, delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one, and delta of x is x tensor x. So you might recognize this um, from Jake's lectures. When he constructed Havana homology, he exactly used this, um, well, this is kind of for the unknot. And, and basically at every, for every edge map, when you, ha you have a gluing or, um, or a split, and these are the maps that determine that. So some Frobenius, so this Frobenius algebra was used by uh, Kovanov um, to basically give Kovanov homology, which ends up being some, well, some TQFT for knots. So this gives a one plus one dimensional TQFT, but it also gives one for knots in a more complicated way. So Jake explained how to do this. Um, yeah, so I'll start writing like numbers on the board to make sure I cover all the lectures. So this is how lecture number two comes in play. Great. Um, okay, and um, yes, kovanov lee homology is also from a slightly different Frobenius algebra. All right, let me talk now, okay, so another example, it's invertible TQFTs. Uh, so this means that, um, so this is a particular case of TQFTs where the objects and morphisms are invertible. under the tensor product. So, okay, so another way to think about it is TQFTs form a symmetric monoidal category. You can tensor two of them together and get another one, and there's a unit TQFT, which just gives the vector space K to everything and the identity map to every cobordism, and these are the ones that are invertible. But basically what this means is that kind of all the vector spaces has to be just K, so, yeah, so they're, they're, they're much simpler than the general case, uh, but they're still interesting. Um, so, for example, in one plus one dimensions, you get Frobenius algebras, but now A has to be K, and then you have, well, you have this co-multiplication, co-multiplication which goes from K to K times K, which is K. So basically, delta is given by some it turns out to be, it has to be invertible, so it's a unit in K. And then epsilon is, uh, I think it's mu inverse. So the, the, they're basically uh, determined by um, a unit in the field. So yeah, if, let's say in C star, if K is C. Um, and okay, so these are easier, but um, that means that we can actually study them. Um, and yes, in general, it's, cl it's hard to classify topological quantum field theories. They're, yes, they're very complicated, especially when you start adding decorations and embeddings. But invertible TQFTs uh, can be studied uh, with homotopy theory. And they are related to, well, to the category of, of cobordisms in d plus one dimensions. And uh, they, are, they are also, if you understand them, they are related to basically classifying space of diffeomorphism groups of M. And they are related to manifold bundles. So if you want to classify bundles over the manifold where the fiber is some 
given manifold, or diffeomorphic to a given manifold. This is like maps to BDIF, and somehow you can understand them in terms of, uh, well, they're related to this category of cobordisms. And basically all of these ideas will be the focus of lecture series number three by Soren Galatius. Okay, so this will be the more algebraic topologic uh, lecture series of the bunch. Okay, so as I said, the concept of topological quantum field theory came from physics, and in fact, um, yes, many of the interesting examples that um, you'll encounter come from physics, so um, let me explain in what ways. So basically, if you want more examples, more interesting examples, they come from quantum field theories. And they come in two different ways. So there are two kinds of TQFTs. First of all, we have, we have TQFTs of Schwartz type. Um, okay, uh, basically, which are based on path integrals. And the typical example of this, uh, well, basically what this says is that um, at least for closed manifolds, um, for in the dimension d plus one, the numbers that you're supposed to get are given by path integral, like by, by an integral over an infinite dimensional space of paths, the kind of thing that you study in quantum field theory. So the typical example is Chern-Simons theory. This is a two plus one dimensional TQFT. And let me not tell you what it does to, uh, to two manifolds, but let me tell you what it does to a three manifold that's closed. It associates uh, some number, well, then I guess I called it x. So z of x is the integral over the space of all connections in some given bundle over x let's say maybe the trivial SU2 bundle, of e to the uh, 2 pi i k churn simons the churn simons functional of the connection, and then d of a. So this is a, well, this is an infinite dimensional space, and this integral doesn't make too much mathematical sense. I mean, it does work trying to make sense of it, but uh, roughly that's what it is from physics, so this is something written down by Witten, but then uh, mathematicians manage to give um, a, a definition of this invariant, kind of figuring out what properties they should have. They gave a definition in terms of uh, surgery descriptions of three manifolds, and this basically gave, the, they gave what's called the witten reshetikin turayev invariants, turayev Invariants of three man of the three manifold. So this these are usually called WRT. They are the beginning of what's called quantum topology. Um, and yes, and I think uh, Pavel Putrov will talk about them in lecture five. And um, yes, which starts this week as well. Um, let me let me just say one important thing. You can also do the, you can add what's called Wilson loops. Uh, so you can add in here the trace of the holonomy of A around some loop gamma. This is called inserting a Wilson loop. 
and well, let's say some, okay, some not. And this way you can put knots in the picture and you can insert more and you can get a link. So basically you also have WRT for links in three manifolds. And in particular for links in R3, what you get is exactly the Jones polynomial. Uh, well, if, if the bundle is the SU2 bundle, or other words, are the SLN polynomials that, again, Jake Rasmussen talked about. So these are some famous invariants of knots, which were uh, discussed in lecture number two. So, yes, yeah, so one way to think of them is as uh, coming from this uh, path integral. Okay. How am I doing? Okay, I have halfway through. Great. Um, okay. So this, so this, this are these are what's called TQFTs of Schwartz type. So then, the other way that TQFTs come from physics are TQFTs of Witten type. Um, and this happens in the presence of supersymmetry. So basically some supersymmetric quantum field theories, not all of them, you need some property. Um, you can do something that's called topological twist. And get some TQFT. Um, yeah, so I'll give, this is what I talk about in the rest of the lecture. I'm not gonna explain much about physics, but um, what I want to do is, well, just, ex just say what some buzzwords mean, <laughs> uh, like supersymmetry and things like that, and then I will give um, some examples, the ones that are, interest, um, are of interest to mathematicians. So, yes, uh, okay, so let me mention some features of this, of this kind of theories. Uh, first of all, they're, um, so they come from TQFT, so there's some quantum system involving some h bar. And then when you set h bar equals zero, uh, you get the classical limit. So that's classical field theory, which is usually much easier. It's in terms of differential equations. Now the topological twist, the TQFT, doesn't actually uh, involve h bar. So it, you can actually read it kind of from the classical limit, and everything is going to determine. So the TQFT is of Witten type, um, yeah, so the TQFTs are kind of determined typically by solutions to some partial differential equations. And the typical examples, I'm going to come back to, to this in a moment, are cyborg witten or, or Yang-Mills equations. Um, Yes, let me say, okay, what is supersymmetry? Okay, you usually abbreviated as SUSI. Well, in physics you have two types of fields. You have um, bosons and fermions. Okay, so the typical boson is the photon, and the typical fermions are the electron, or the proton, or the neutron. Okay, but mathematically, uh, well, okay, let, let me just say it like this. So, boson, so they're all fields, they're sections of some bundle, um, these have integer spin, so you should think of them, well, for example, vector fields, just elements of uh, Tx, just sections of Tx, um, or scalar fields, that's another example. Uh, and these ones have half integer spin. So the typical examples are spinners, 
And I think you've seen spinners in Hadish lectures. Um, right, I mean, there's many theories of this type. Uh, the point is, fields come into, into, into two, uh, out of these two categories, and some theories involve both fields. And then there is a symmetry between the fields, and that's called supersymmetry. So basically, when you have a theory of this type uh, that um, exchanges the two, that's called the supersymmetry. And I guess let me also mention the notion of supercharge. This is a generator of the supersymmetry group. Okay, so you have a supersymmetry group, and um, yes, it, and typically it's determined by a finite number of superchargers of the SUSI transformations. Okay, another uh, word you will uh, hear in physics talks. I'm sorry for physicists in the audience. I mean, I know this is kind of uh, very low level for you, but um, yes, <laughs> I think mathematicians, uh, as a mathematician, I, uh, I had, uh, it took me a while to figure out what these things mean. Okay, so there's a notion of BPS state, which you will encounter over and over again. So this stands for Bogomolny, Prasad, and Summerfield. Uh, and what it is, it's, uh, well, it's a state in this kind of um, uh, theory, supersymmetric theories. It's a state, I mean, yes, so a physical theory is, a quantum physical theory is usually in terms of states uh, that the theory can be in, and there are operators acting on them. So the superchargers are one of them. So these are fields that are annihilated by the supercharge. Um, But okay, this, for mathematicians, this might not mean much. Um, the way to think about them is that they are given by solutions to a first order OD, uh, to a first order partial differential equations, and they minimize some energy. Um, and actually, oh, all right, so let me maybe give an example. So there is Yang-Mills theory, which I'll come back to this. Read. Where you have a connection, uh, well, it's in terms of connections, and the, the Yang-Mills equation says that d star of the curvature of the connection is zero. But in mathematics, people study something more specific, which is the ASD equation, anti-self-dual. This is a particular case of solutions, and that's just that star FA equals minus FA. 